Well, thank you for joining us. This will be Creation Science Evangelism, Class 103, CSE 103. If you missed the first two, uh, 101 and 102, you can get those on videotape. What we're doing is we're covering what's on my uh, seminar on creation at a much slower pace, covering all the details, taking time for any questions. And if you have any questions, if you're in the class here, of course, if you're on video, you, you can write us in or call us with questions. But here in the class, if you have any questions, raise your hand and say, wait a minute, what does this mean? Or let's talk about that some more. We left off in our last class uh, talking about the lies in the textbooks, things that kids have to face every day in school, they faced them today, things that have been proven wrong many years ago. Some people would like kids to believe in evolution. They want them to believe that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, and they have to give them some evidence. One of the evidences presented in just about every textbook is this one right here. This textbook says, we have evidence of evolution from micro or molecular biology. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, molecular, of course, means at the molecule level, very, very, very tiny, and biology is the study of life. Bio means life, ology means the study of. So they're saying the study of extremely small branches of life, the molecules, gives evidence for evolution. Well, now, does it really? Let's just talk about that. Um, a molecule is very tiny. A good illustration to understand how small a molecule is, the best one I know of, is a grain of salt. You know how small a grain of salt is, right? One cube of salt is very tiny. If you took a grain of salt and expanded it so that it was as tall as the Sears Tower, 1,200 feet tall, I believe the Sears Tower is, and 1,200 feet wide and 1,200 feet deep, if you expanded it to that size, the molecules would expand at the same ratio. They would become large enough that they would become the size of the original grain of salt. How many grains of salt would it take to stack up to be equal to the top of the Sears Tower? Several, right? That's how many molecules are stacked up the side of a cube of salt. So molecules are extremely tiny. And they're telling the kids, see, we've got evidence from molecular biology. Well, in the early 50s, Jan, did you find anything about DNA in those old textbooks? Not even mentioned. 1911 biology textbook doesn't mention DNA at all, does it? How about the 1925 textbook? No mention at all. What did you find in yours, Steve? About molecular biology. Um, or DNA. DNA. I guess that uh, three natural processes underline evolution. They emphasize evolution in every case, right? Did you find it in yours? Uh, about DNA? Yeah, they, in all the new textbooks, those are 98 edition textbooks. I've got some 2001s uh, in the office. I couldn't find them in, the, in, the, in a hurry there. But all the new textbooks say DNA offers evidence for evolution. Well, now, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It is a molecule. The DNA molecule is the most complicated molecule in the universe that is, that is known today. This textbook says um, the greater the percentage of DNA sequence, the, greater they have in, uh, the more they have in common. In other words, they're comparing the sequences and saying this proves some kind of similarity. This textbook says Darwin speculated that all forms of life, all forms of life are related through descent with modification from earliest organisms. Earlier, the earliest organisms. This speculation has been verified as we have learned more about molecular biology. Now look what they're teaching the kids in this book. They're saying Darwin guessed that everything was related. Now we know it's true. That's the propaganda the kids have to face. Now we know it's true. Now just hold on a minute. If there are similar DNA sequences, and we'll get into that in a minute, would that prove we're related? Or could it prove we have the same designer? Would you agree that the, the Ford and the, uh, let's take the Ford uh, Lincoln, the, uh, say Lincoln Continental, and the uh, other cars built by Ford Motor Company have lots of similarities? Probably many of them have a radiator in the front, and a front bumper, and a back bumper, and four tires, and the tires are round, as round as they can make them. Does that prove they all evolved from a golf cart? Or could it prove they have the same designers, the same engineers? So what happens here, we get into a logical fallacy. They say, well, look, because we're similar DNA to these organisms, therefore we must be related. I say, no, no, no. We have a common designer. So don't fall into the trap that this proves evolution or even helps to support evolution. It does not. This is a lie that's in the textbooks that kids have to face every day. And they'll say, well, we've got proof of evolution from DNA. This, this is a picture of a DNA molecule. If you took a ladder 
We had a long extension ladder, a real long extension ladder that went about from here to Chicago. And we had one end, somebody holding that end still in Chicago, and here I am in Florida, and I start twisting my end of the ladder and twist it around and around and around. So like twisting up a, a watch band, okay? The individual rungs of the ladder are called the genes, G-E-N-E. -E. So when they talk about genetic similarity, that's what they're talking about. These genes are similar. So if we have this ladder that goes from Florida to Chicago, and we have twisted it up in a long spiral, the two sides of the ladder stay the same distance apart, but it kind of curves as it goes around, and the rungs of the ladder, the round part, will hold it that distance apart, but now it's like a spiral staircase. If we twist it and twist it and twist it, it starts pretty soon to knot in on itself, so it's actually double twisted. And you can tell by the picture here, if you take a DNA molecule and unwind it, it becomes incredibly long. You figure the average human body has uh, 50 trillion cells. Only, the only cell visible to the naked eye is the egg cell that a woman produces in order to have a baby. All other cells in the body are too small to see without a, at least a good magnifying glass and, in most cases, a microscope. With a real strong magnifying glass, you can see cells. You can uh, take, we did experiments in biology class where you take a popsicle stick and you scrape the inside of your cheek and you can get skin cells off very easily. Put on a piece of glass, stick it under the microscope, add a little iodine, and it'll stain the cells and you can actually study the different parts of the cell. A cell is sort of like, a, I guess an egg is the best example, at least in an animal cell, because they have a, an outer membrane that is soft and then all the stuff, there's thousands of things inside the cell. Uh, one cell is more complicated than a city. But Inside the cell is another little membrane that holds the nucleus. Like inside the egg is the yolk, the yellow part to the egg. Inside that nucleus are the DNA molecules. So we're talking really, really tiny. DNA wasn't even discovered until uh, probably the middle of this century. You can see the old textbooks don't even mention it at all. I meant to get some of the 1940 textbooks I've got and 50 and 60 textbooks and compare and see when they begin talking about DNA. It'd be a good research project somebody could do. But uh, Francis Crick and somebody else, I forget his name, got a uh, Nobel Prize for discovering the DNA molecule. I think it was in the 1950s when they got that. So they called it the double helix because it twists and then it twists again while it's twisted. Those molecule, those DNA molecules are incredibly tiny. But the, if you unwound one of them, it would be about six or seven feet long. Forty-six of these DNA molecules, and one DNA molecule is called a chromosome. Each, can each chromosome contains millions of genes. So the gene is like the rung of the ladder. The entire thing is called the chromosome. You have 46 of these in each cell in your body except for the gametes. Now, a gamete is, called, is a sex cell. The egg and the sperm are called gametes. They each have 23, half of the genetic information. And when a woman gets pregnant, the uh, half from the male and the half from the female join together and makes it back to 46. So a fertilized embryo, a fertilized egg, and now has 46 chromosomes. It got half from the mother and half from the father. So during the process when it divides, uh, it's called a gamete. Let's see. Uh, these chromosomes, about 40, 46 of them in every cell in a human. Average human has 50 trillion cells in their body, which is a number that is just beyond comprehension. For those that don't remember, when you count, a million is the number 1,000 with one more group of zeros. So it would be 1,000 plus three more zeros. A billion has two sets of zeros. So a total of nine zeros. It's a thousand plus two sets of zeros. And a trillion has three sets of zeros. If you learn to count in Latin, you can count as high as you care to go. Million for mono, billion for bi, like a bicycle has two wheels. Trillion for tricycle, like three wheels. Quadrillion would be next, like a quad runner or something with four wheel drive. Quadra traction for the Jeep. Then quintillion would be five sets of zeros plus the original thousand. And then sextillion, septillion, octillion, novillion, decillion. And who cares, right? Anyway, uh, so a trillion cells is an awfully lot of cells. When you figure the entire population of the planet is nowhere close to this number. There are only about six billion people in the world. This is 50,000 billion cells in your body. 
Each one of those cells contains a little nucleus in the center. And the vast majority have 46 chromosomes. A few have 23. The gametes do. If you took all the DNA out of one person, it would fill about two tablespoons. Teaspoons are the small ones. Tablespoons are the big ones. It would fill two tablespoons with just pure DNA. If you took one chromosome from every individual on the planet, and this chromosome, each chromosome contains the blueprint, the instructions for how to build the entire person. So if you had one chromosome from each person on the planet, theoretically, you could make every person again. You have the information to make a new Becky, or a new Steve, or a new Eric, or whoever, okay, from one chromosome. All of that information, five billion or six billion chromosomes, would be about the size of an aspirin. That's the information capable of making every human being again on the planet. That's with our current understanding. We may discover later that even this is mostly space and it could be condensed even smaller than that. Just unbelievably complicated. Now, if you unwound each one of those chromosomes, number 46 in each cell, each one is about six or seven feet long. So you get six or seven feet times 46 times 50 trillion. One person's chromosomes would stretch from Earth to the moon and back. Round trips, five million round trips to the moon. And keep in mind, that is like a twisted ladder. Now, to make it even more interesting, if we had our ladder from here to Chicago, and we twisted it and twisted it and twisted it, and as you, like you do a rubber band, you get it tighter and tighter, and pretty soon it starts to double knot. You know, it's, it starts to loop again. Okay, similar idea. We're going to take this long ladder from here to Chicago and split it all the way down the middle. Each one of the rungs of the ladder is going to be cut in half. All the way from here to Chicago. While it's twisted, it is going to unwind from the other half. So we have two half ladders. That's going to join up with the other half ladder from your husband or wife, wind itself back together from here to Chicago, and make a child. Each half of the rung is a genetic trait. Maybe the dad supplies the half of the rung for blonde hair, and the wife supplies the half of the rung for brown hair. Well, which one's the baby going to have? Well, that gets into which one of these genes is more dominant. There are dominant and recessive genes. The baby might end up with blonde hair, but capable of producing a brown-haired child. Because even though what expressed itself in that generation was blonde hair, they are carrying the gene, the half rung of the ladder, for brown hair. So then the grandkids come out with brown hair, or depending on who they marry. And that's a very interesting study. You get into that in biology class, studying all the, you know, what can happen when you cross different genes together. But the genetic structure is incredibly complicated. They say that the code in the chromosomes is more complex and holds more information than all the computer programs ever written in the history of humanity combined. Incredibly complicated. Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, he said, DNA is like a software program, but it's much more complex than anything we've been able to design. Now, when they design a software program, how frequently do they encounter a glitch or a problem? Do any of you work with computers at all? You ever seen a computer have a glitch where the program doesn't work? All the time, right? Now, suppose I told you to take your computer program, we're going to load uh, Windows uh, Millennium Edition, or Windows 98, or Windows 95, okay? Any one of those programs. I want you to take that program with all that list of instructions and copy it onto a disk. Now I want you to take that copy and copy that onto another disk. Then take that disk and copy it onto another disk. The more times you copy it, the more likely you are to have mistakes come in, problems come in. You ever seen a photocopy of a piece of paper where somebody copied an article and somebody else said, wow, this is good, I'm going to make a copy of this. So they copy the copy. Then this person says, wow, that's really good, I'm going to copy that. So they copy the copy of the copy. After about eight or ten copies, you can't hardly read it. You ever gotten something like that? You just say, wow, it's all blurred, you know, everything starts to run together. We are a copy, off of a copy, off of a copy, off 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 a copy of Adam. Realize how many times this gene code has been duplicated? And still working pretty good. 
the original must have been awesome <laughs> to have this number of generations of copies still working at all. You know, so. To say DNA is small and therefore it must be simple is absolutely ridiculous, okay? It is unbelievably complicated. If you typed out the code, and here's what happens. A DNA has four base pairs. What they've done is they've taken each of these genes and they get a whole cluster of molecules and call it a base pair, like they give it a letter A. So they will say, well, DNA is very simple. There are only four base pairs. Well, hold it. That's like me saying, you know, vehicles on the highway are very simple. There's only four basic kinds. You know, there's trucks, there's cars, there's motorcycles, and there's buses. Well, just because I can put them into four simple categories doesn't mean each one is simple. Each one of those categories is very complex. You know, how many, how many things are there on a car? Remember, Eric, the first car you had, you know, 13 years old, we rebuilt that old Datsun, or uh, no, whatever it was, Datsun 510. A car is complicated. How many things would have to be wrong to make a car quit working? Any one of thousands of things. When my dad was in the Marines, he said uh, during World War II, one of their jobs was to go into the islands after they took over from the Japanese, set up radar, the early days of radar. My dad was involved in that. And they had a diesel engine. The engine ran a generator to power, to give them electricity to run the radar station. So they had to be really good mechanics. If anything goes wrong, you've got to fix it. As part of their training, they would have somebody come in there after they learned all about the engine, how it runs. They would sabotage it to make it not run, and you had to see how long it took you to figure out the problem. Can you imagine all the neat things you could do to cause an engine to not run, to give somebody a hard time? You take the distributor cap off, take a pencil, whoosh, draw a few lines around there, put it back on. Graphite conducts electricity. So as soon as it tries to spark to one spark plug, the spark goes to all spark plugs. It follows the graphite around the inside. Very simple. Car won't run. He said the hardest one for him to find was when the, the sergeant came in there and he took the spark plug wires, which are going out, he took a needle, poked it through two wires, clipped the needle off, roughed up the rubber so you couldn't tell it was there, but the spark was being conducted from those two each time. It was supposed to go to the spark plug, it went to both of them. Engine wouldn't run. He said that was the hardest one to find. Just a simple thing to sabotage it. When you think how the more complex something becomes, the easier it is for something to break down. Look at our space shuttle. You know, we had one blow up. One little O-ring. Out of X number of zillion parts on that thing, one part went wrong. Uh, I was driving on the highway one time in driver's head. Here I am, teacher sitting beside me, two students in the back seat. The car in front of me, in the other lane on the interstate highway, the front wheel began to wobble back and forth wildly. Pretty soon the hubcap flew off and sailed right over our car, just like a frisbee, or like a flying saucer. I speeded up to get past him, because I knew something was wrong. What had happened? A tie rod that ties the two front wheels together had broken. And so his steering wheel was controlling one wheel, the other one's flopping back and forth. Well, which way is the car going to go? I don't know. He didn't know either, and I didn't want to be there to find out. So I just took off and got past him to, uh, to avoid. But just one little part, a little tie rod broke. In radar, Steve, how many things can go wrong to make your base, make your radar station quit, quit working? Anything. Anything, right? And it's usually something different every time. DNA is incredibly complicated, so you're going to find some people who mistakenly think that a DNA molecule, they'll say it is very simple because there are only four base pairs. That is like saying, you know, traffic patterns are very simple, there's only four kinds of vehicles. It's not quite that simple, okay? Matter of fact, it's a long way from being that simple. If you typed out the genetic code, found in the chromosomes of one person. When you got done typing, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 40 times. An incredible amount of information. Do you realize how many bits of information are required to make a hair? If you ever look at a hair under a microscope, you say, man, that thing's unbelievably complex. Now, how does the hair on your arm know to grow a certain distance and stop? But the hair on your chin just keeps growing. How do it know? <laughs> you ever wonder about that? I mean, it's, you got the hair, then you got the molecules that are producing the hair. And then, if you get a cut, you cut your arm right across a hair follicle. How does the skin cell know when it fixes the damage? If it's going to make, you know, which kind of, uh, which kind of skin cell is it supposed to, re, you know, make to repair the damage? The 
information contained in the chromosomes is incredibly complicated. O King David said in Psalm 139 many years ago, he said, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't even have a microscope, and he knew he ought to praise God. The body is incredibly complicated. So I get nervous when these folks say, well, the body, you know, DNA is very simple. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. DNA is complicated. When a baby is conceived, it begins to multiply. The cell, the initial cell, splits in half. So here's what happens. You've got these 46 chromosomes, one fertilized egg cell. Each one of those 46 chromosomes, from here to Chicago, each one, inside that little sac, unwinds, splits in half, makes a copy of itself, and winds back up, and then makes two cells. You get about 15,000 new cells per minute for nine months. Each one of those cells is more complicated than a space shuttle. Now I say in my seminar, you know, how would you like to work in a factory that produced 15,000 space shuttles a minute? When I worked at General Motors, truck and coach, in Pontiac, Michigan, we made 250 trucks in eight hours. There was a new truck that came by every one minute and 45 seconds. I did my thing on the front end, you know, we put the headlight clamps in and the springs and all that to hold the headlights and the grill and the radiator clips, sent it on to the next guy. He bolted the fenders on, sent it to the next guy. He put the radiator in, you know, and started putting the fan shroud on and sent it to the next guy. He flipped it over, put the headlights in and the chrome rims on, sent it on to the next guy. Every minute and 45 seconds, a new truck. We had to work hard with an awful lot of guys to produce 250 trucks in eight hours. The baby growing in the mother produces 15,000 new cells every minute, round the clock. And I'll say in my seminar, how would you like to work in a factory making 15,000 space shuttles a minute? How would you like to be in charge of supply? Suppose, Steve, your job was to supply the springs that hold the headlights in, and you've got to bring enough to the factory to supply 15,000 a minute, forever, never nonstop. You'd be busy running back and forth getting new springs, wouldn't you? A lot of women say, yeah, I did that for nine months. Man, it's hard. Sometimes the baby wants pickles in the middle of the night. You know, you got to go get up and go get them, you know. So <laughs> you just never know. Um, I, I, I really worry about folks, though, who I think Satan has blinded people into thinking, because it's smaller, therefore it's simpler. And that just simply is not logical. The DNA is the most complex molecule we know of. They say the probability of one DNA happening by chance is 1 times 10 to the 119,000th power. Now, if you don't know the way powers work, uh, 10 to the second power means 10 times itself two times. That's 100. 10 to the third power is 10 times itself times itself, or 10 times itself times itself. That would be 1,000. It would have three zeros, 10 to the third power. 10 to the 119,000th power is 10 with 119,000 zeros behind it. Those big numbers get lost easily in the human brain, so a good analogy to help folks understand how big this is. If you measured the size of the entire universe, as far as we can see, Estimates are the universe currently that we can observe with our current telescopes is probably 15 to 20 billion light years across. At the speed of light, which is pretty fast, take 15 or 20 billion years to get across the galaxy, the universe that we see. Change that to inches. That is 10 to the 28 inches. The current observable universe is 10 to the 28th power inches in diameter. That's a huge number. A 10 to the 29th would be 10 times bigger than that. 10 to the 30th is 10 times bigger than that. 10 to the 119,000th is real big. So that's the odds that these people are gambling on that a DNA could happen by chance. I tell people, look, if you want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. I don't care what you believe. They say the odds of a DNA happening, there's all kinds of analogies have been given to try to help people understand. If you filled the space of the entire solar system, you got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, way out there. If you filled that entire space with pennies, painted one of them red, let a blind man loose, he has one chance to find the red penny. Uh, those kind of analogies help you understand, and the brain can't absorb this, no matter how you try to explain it, but that's, that's the chances of one day and happening by chance. 
Well, I did a, a spoof on evolution, I call it, just as, as fun, because uh, I knew that the chromosome number does certainly not follow the expected evolutionary pattern. Since each chromosome is the most complex molecule we know of, I said, you know, the more chromosomes you have, the more complicated you would be. And I've had, of course, evolutionists, they blast every sentence in my seminar, and they've blasted this one saying, oh, no, it's not the chromosome number, it's the number of genes. And, you know, because some chromosomes are longer than others. You know, how many rungs on that ladder for a human versus how many rungs on that ladder for uh, a hamster, okay? There, there are different lengths of chromosomes. All chromosomes are not equal. Th they've not even all been studied to know how many genes there are on each one. But the number of chromosomes also has a factor involved in the complexity of the organism. Penicillin has two chromosomes. So when a penicillin divides or grows, it only has two chromosomes that have to unwind, split, copy themselves, and wind back together. Which, of course, requires a lot of energy for this to happen also. And that's another whole long system on how the Michael Behe's book, uh, Darwin's Black Box, explaining the complexity of the cell is really amazing. Uh, well worth reading. But fruit flies have eight chromosomes. So I put these animals and plants and things in order as a spoof to make fun of the evolution theory. How that, you know, the more complex you get, the more you evolve. And how penicillin evolved first and slowly turned into a fruit fly. And over millions of years, got some more chromosomes and became either a tomato or a house fly. They're twins, you know. Nobody can tell the difference between a tomato and a house fly. They both have 12 chromosomes. This would be the, like the number of instruction manuals to build that organism. A tomato and a house fly same number of chromosomes. Hmm. Does that prove anything? Slowly it evolved into a P, of course, with 14 chromosomes, and then I'd add the numbers up. This is, these are the actual number of chromosomes found in these organisms. Now, possums, redwood trees, and kidney beans all have 22. Proving, of course, you know, they're twins, identical triplets this time, you know, closely related. Most people can't tell the difference between a possum, a redwood tree, and a kidney bean. Average scientists can't, that's for sure, because they're, you know, obviously identical. And then slowly, over millions of years, we evolved enough chromosomes and finally became a human. Humans have 46. What happens if a human gets extra chromosomes? Anybody know what that's called? Sometimes kids are born with 48 chromosomes. Really? Down's syndrome. Really? Ungoloid. Extra, extra pair of chromosomes. Is it advantageous? No. It's a disadvantage. 46 chromosomes. Now, if we can just get two more chromosomes, we should be a tobacco plant. They have 48. They're, they're way ahead of us evolving. And you can see, obviously, tobacco and chimpanzees are, are twins, you know, identical. Um, dogs and chickens are also. They both have 78 chromosomes. Now, why would a chicken have more chromosomes than a human? And then, of course, slowly over millions of years, we got enough chromosomes to become a carp. More than twice as complex as humans. A simple carp. And a fern has 480 chromosomes. And some evolutionists will argue, yeah, but the number of genes is different on these things. Okay, but they're missing the entire point. Probably intentionally, they're missing the point. But this textbook, and like most textbooks you have there in front of you, will try to show the kids that DNA similarities proves some kind of relationship. Here's what they've done. You take the chromosome of a human, let's say, and there's only four types of base pairs. I think they label them A, D, uh, D uh, I used to know the names, I'm going to go blank right now. But they give them a letter. Let's call it A, B, C, D. That's not the right letters, but it's close to that. They will take the sequence. They'll say, look, a human's, the sequence, like the code, is, you know, A, B, C, D, D, A, B, A, C. And they put this long sequence of letters, okay? Then they line up the sequence of letters for a chimpanzee. And they find how many places do they match? Look at that. In the seventh column, they both got an A. Wow. And in the tenth column, they both have a B. Wow, that proves we're related. <laughs> I don't know how this logic got into there, but that's what they think. So they've compared these long sequence of letters. I guess they have nothing else to do with their grant money. And they compare these long sequence of letters and say, humans and chimpanzees are 98.2% similar. So when they say the DNA is similar, they're saying the sequence of these base pairs matched 98% of the time. Well, Jan, you've taught English for years. I'm, I'm sure you could think up all kinds of sentences that are 98% similar. Only a few letters are different. 
But the sentence means, sentence means something very different. You only got to change a letter here and there to totally change a word. Nick, trying to learn English, you know how many words there are? There are only one letter different, and it's a totally different word. Very difficult. And Russian probably has the same thing, right? With different letters, different words. Look almost the same. One letter is different. Means something totally different. But we ought to go through. Somebody maybe could do that. Is get a, make a sentence or a paragraph that is 98% similar. But have a totally different meaning. That would be a neat uh, spoof to do. I'd like to have one to use in my seminar here. Um, does that prove they're related? Absolutely nothing. This has nothing to do with relationship. The fact that all forms of life, or all these chromosomes, have the same four base pairs is like saying, you know, and they'll say, see, that proves evolutionary relationship. I would say, now wait a minute, you can come to my library, and you'll notice all the books in there, written in English, have only 26 basic letters. Same 26 letters used over and over and over and over again. Aren't they? Does that prove they're related somehow? No. That proves that's the code you write words from. And the code you write chromosomes from is this base pair code, which proves the designer thought, you know, I'm going to make them similar so that the brown cow can eat the green grass and digest it. If each organism had its own separate code, like when I try to see the Russian words or the German or the French or the Italian as I travel around, a lot of, like Chinese, Jan, you over in China, they have a different code. They don't use any of our letters. You not, only, you not only have to learn the language, you have to learn the letters. That's where it's a little easier to learn French or Spanish. At least they've got the same letters we do in most cases, a few you know, different. Russians, of course, make their R backwards from us, and uh, whatever that means. But the code has, has some similarities, but it also has some differences between these languages. The code for life is pretty much the same. And some have argued that's evidence of evolution. No, no, no. That's evidence that the designer made it where we can, you know, eat and digest these things. If they, if they all had different codes, it wouldn't work. Eric, if I gave you a Russian newspaper and said, I want you to cut out the letters and reassemble them and make an English sentence, you probably could do that. If I said, I want you to cut out the letters and make a whole book, well, you probably eventually are going to come across some letters that Russians don't have, that you need in English, but they don't have one available. Same thing if you're translating from Russian to English, okay? There may be some letters, I don't know which ones, that just, they don't exist. Do you have an X in Russian? Do you have an X? Do you have a right, uh, the R facing the right way, or just the backwards R? Just the backwards one, not the regular one. So you'd be hard-pressed then to make a lot of words. How many words have an R that you now cannot make? It would greatly limit your ability to write that book. Certain words you just can't use. There isn't, aren't any available. So if there weren't similarities of these uh, base pairs and of the amino acids and in the, in the chromosomes and the DNA structure and in the molecules and in the proteins, we couldn't digest anything else except other humans. That would be very unhandy after a couple of generations. So they'll say, you know, orangutans are 96% similar. And the textbook shows the kids a graph here and says, see, this tells how many millions of years ago we evolved from a common ancestor. Well, that is just silly, okay? It doesn't prove we evolved from a common ancestor uh, 15 million years ago from a monkey group. It could prove we have a common designer and the same guy wrote these codes. Certain authors, when they write, they'll use certain words over and over again. And sometimes they have certain styles of writing, you know, these different authors do. But judging by that, same DNA code would prove the same engineer wrote the codes, not evolution. So why the textbooks always teach the kids this is evidence for evolution is beyond my comprehension. Either they're not capable of thinking, maybe this proves a common designer, or they're running from that designer, like Romans chapter 1 tells us. They do not want to retain God in their knowledge. And so they only see it one way. All right, we'll talk about thinking critically after a little break here. Okay, let's continue now. I want you to see what this textbook says. This is common uh, propaganda, for lack of a better word, in a high school textbook, talking about how they're going to teach the kids to think critically. But look at the way they phrase the sentence. Question number 24. 
inferring conclusions. Boys and girls, we're going to learn how to infer conclusions here. How might the structure of plant cells be different if you bacteria had not evolved? Well, doesn't that question assume they evolved? You see how the propaganda is built right into the question. Suppose you got a Christian student in this class who does not believe in evolution. He believes God made everything. How is he supposed to answer a question like that? What's he going to do for homework? How's he going to answer that question? He's really stuck. He's not learning to think critically. He's learning how to be taught what to think. Question 25. Inferring conclusions. If insects had not evolved wings, how would it have affected their invasion of land? <laughs> what a stupid question. Assuming, of course, they evolved wings. Look at this number 26. As you learned in chapter 2, all living things make proteins from the same 20 kinds of amino acids. Let's back up a little bit here. An amino acid is sort of like a letter of the alphabet. There are 26 letters in the English alphabet. Would you agree that all English words are made out of those 26 letters? The little words and the big words all made from the same 26 letters. Okay? The proteins in your body, you have protein for your fingernails, protein for hair, protein for eyeballs, protein for skin, protein for muscle. All proteins are made from the same 20 amino acids. That's a fact. Look what it says. Explain how this fact, and it is a fact, supports the idea that all life shares a common ancestor. Anybody got any ideas? Does that, is that the only conclusion you can draw from that? Eric, what would you say this proves? Probably had a common designer, right? Sure. All the books in my library have the same 26 letters of the alphabet. That proves they all evolved from Morse code millions of years ago. No, it doesn't. It proves somebody's using the basic code to write their thoughts down. And the proteins are all based on these 20 basic amino acids. And again, that's so the brown cow can eat the green grass, who gives the white milk, and I eat a churn it and get yellow butter, and I eat it and get blonde hair. Because these 20 amino acids get broken up, like chopping up the letters of the newspaper, and reassemble to make a new protein. So when I eat something, your body breaks it down and reassembles it into a new protein that you need. Similar structures nearly always have similar plans, in this case, DNA. Similar bridges have similar blueprints. This hardly constitutes evidence that one sired the other or that they were erected by tornadoes. So how people can be so blind as to not see that similarity does not prove a common ancestor, it could prove, or it does prove, a common designer. They're too complex. People have a pretty good understanding of how cars work. I've had 111 cars now, as of this time. I've done just about everything you can do to a car. Rebuilt the motors, the transmissions, the differentials, the, you know, a lot of body work, stuff like that. I don't have time anymore, but I, I've done all that stuff. Started teaching my kids when they were a little bitty, you know. My daughter's water pump went out on her first car. Dad, my water pump's out. Would you fix it? No, ma'am. I'll help you fix it. She said, I'm a girl. I said, I know. What if it's going to break down in the middle of the country someplace? You better learn how this thing works. And so she changed the water pump. I mean, of all the things to learn working on a car, water pump's a little tough to get at. You know, you've got to undo 14 other things to find the water pump and then change it. Well, she did it. I didn't touch it hardly. I just stood back and said, okay, now do this. See, this is in the way here. That's what you're trying to get to. If you thoroughly understood a car, if you did enough mechanic work, uh, Steve, you're going to be an airplane or jet pilot, you're probably going to have to understand those jets pretty well. Lots and lots of training on how they work. If you ever thoroughly understood everything on a jet, would that prove nobody designed it? No. You couldn't stand back and say, well, you know, because I understand it, therefore nobody made it. That is just flawed logic. See, if you understand how a machine operates, that has nothing to do with the origin of it. I understand the operation of a ballpoint pen. How the ink is in that little tube, you know, and the ball rolls around, and it uses all sorts of different physical factors to draw the ink down. You know, there's capillary action used in a ballpoint pen. Does that prove a ballpoint pen happened by chance? No, just because I understand it doesn't prove anything about the origin of it. And this is where some of these people get confused. They somehow think that operation and origin are related. So if I can understand how it works, that'll prove nobody made it. Uh, that's, that's, I don't know how they got there. 
I use the illustration, you know, if your kids turn 16, like my kids did. There's Ken Andrew on the camera there. He says, hey, Dad, I got my license. I want to borrow the car. And I'd say, son, now listen, the car is a complex machine. There are 3,000 bolts required to hold a car together. And one nut can scatter it all over the highway <laughs> in a few seconds. I said, now, son, look, your mom and I have been praying about this. We don't think you understand how the car works yet, son. It's a very complex machine. And we don't think you're ready for the whole car this year. But this year, we decided we're going to let you have 10% of the car. Next year, maybe a little more, we'll let you evolve into the car piece by piece. What good is 10% of a car? It's worth nothing. You put them in a junkyard. Now, if you're going to study how cars work, it's pretty a good way to learn is by systems. Let's study the brake system. You push the pedal, it squeezes the master cylinder fluid, you know, goes down the tubes to the wheel cylinders, expands the calipers or whatever. Okay, you study the system. Then you study the electrical system or the fuel system or the whatever, okay? And you're probably going to learn jets that way. Here's this system. Uh, here's this system. And then how these systems integrate. You can study the human body that way. It's a great way to learn biology. You we'll study the circulation system. Study the integumentary system, the skin, okay? Study the nervous system. And then how do these systems relate to each other? But understanding the systems has nothing to do with the origin of it. And again, one thing missing from one of these systems may stop the whole thing from working. How many people have a very complex nervous system? They have a brain, spinal cord, nerves going to every cell in the body. But there's a broken place right at the base of the neck because they had a little car accident. Severed the nerve. Now they're sitting in a wheelchair. Nervous system's still there. One thing's broken. Stops the rest of it from working. Same thing true with any system. You know, the more complex they get, the more likely they are to break down. The more easy they are to have something go wrong. DNA sequences. This uh, fellow from uh, the annual, annual review of uh, ecology and systems uh, says, even with DNA sequence, we have no direct access to the process of evolution. So objective reconstruction of the vanished past can be achieved only by creative imagination. You have to imagine some kind of relationship based upon the sequence. People have argued about what I'm about to say here, but uh, about 1% of the human DNA has been determined. Others have said, no, no, the Human Genome Project, we've decoded the entire thing. Well, that's very deceitful to say that. Okay? To say we've decoded the human DNA is... What, they, what they're saying is, we've taken this ladder that goes from here to Chicago, and we've got the A, B, C, D components figured out where they are. We've written the code down. Writing the code down in big blocks, you know, A, B, C, or D, does not explain, doesn't, doesn't mean you understand it. If I flew over... Uh, let's say a, a Martian came in. There are no Martians or flying saucers. Somebody will accuse me of believing in them. But let's say a Martian comes flying in. He flies over New York City. He looks down. He notices there are four basic kinds of vehicles. In New York City, you got one basic kind, taxi cabs. Okay? But <laughs> we'll, we'll have to pick a different city. He's got, you, know, you see buses. He sees uh, trucks. He sees motorcycles. He sees cars. And let's add a fifth one, bicycles. Okay? Um, and he goes back to his... Uh, country or to his, uh, I, uh, his uh, planet and says, you know, I studied the different cities in America and I found Cincinnati has a code, you know, it's got motorcycle, bus, truck, motorcycle, bus, truck, car, 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 bus. And I went to, you know, Dayton, Ohio and they got uh, a different, slightly different sequence, you know, but 99% similar. That proves these two cities evolved from each other. <laughs> no, oh, stop the music, you know. Is everybody that works around here a moron? You know, like, uh, like uh, who was Ernest said in that movie? Ernest P. Worrell. Um, this similarity would prove nothing as far as relationship or evolution. So actually, to say they've decoded the entire human genome is very deceitful. All they've done is figured out if it's a bus or a truck. They haven't figured out the complexity of that bus. They certainly don't have all the genes figured out in this sequence. So there are thousands of differences. Now, chimpanzees cannot put their little finger against their thumb. You have a muscle that allows you to pull your little finger. You can touch any of your fingers to your thumb. You, the muscles in their feet are different than your muscles in your feet. You cannot 
grab around a tree branch with your big toe on one side and your other toes on the other side. You can try it if you want, but I would recommend you pick a low branch to practice on. Because you're not going to hang there very long, right? But chimpanzees do it just fine, don't they? It's called a grasping foot. Now that's great when you're climbing around through trees. It's not very good for running on the ground. Watch a chimpanzee's feet when it walks on the ground. They have to curl their toes under. They cannot walk flat-footed. They call them a knuckle walker. They walk on their knuckles. And it's very uncomfortable for them to walk on two feet for great distance. They can do it. But they kind of walk bow-legged and their, feet, their feet are, toes are curled under. Humans and chimpanzees have millions of differences. The bones, the muscles, the, the ratio of the length of the bones. Their arms, of course, are much longer compared to their body than humans are. Uh, you could, if you're looking for similarities, you can find them. You know, both have two eyes, same hair color in some cases. Sometimes, you know, some humans and chimpanzees both chew with their mouth open. That doesn't prove they're related to each other. The same designer created these things. And how they got to that stage of saying, you know, we're similar, therefore we're related, I don't understand. No, we're similar, therefore the same God designed us all. It's not that complex. Um, some people, though, say similarities proves relationships. So I did another spoof on this. I'll say, well, if you think similarity proves relationships, let's study the similarity of various objects in the world based upon their water content. Watermelons are, I mean, clouds are 100% water. One atheist said, no, they're not. There's air molecules in between. Okay, <laughs> you're missing the point, right? I understand clouds have air in the middle of the water. But it's basically water in a cloud. Watermelons are 97% water. Only 3% difference. And jellyfish are 98% water. So here we have the missing link. And snow cones are also 98% water. So this proves that, you know, watermelons slowly evolved into either snow cones or jellyfish. I'm not sure which one. They're twins, you know. And then slowly evolved to a cloud or vice versa. Arranging something in order does not prove any kind of similarity. Doesn't prove any relationship. And the textbooks will say that fossils give evidence for evolution. This index to this one, this book has a whole chapter. I've seen some biology books that have an entire unit, you know, five or six chapters just on evolution. They want to make sure the kids believe that when they get out of school. This one says, we have evidence from fossils. Well, let's just discuss this here. Is there any evidence from fossils to prove evolution? Suppose we're in a court of law. I stand up and I say, Your Honor, I, I can prove evolution. I can prove humans came from a monkey, or an ape, or an ape-like ancestor. And the judge says, okay, what's your evidence, Mr. Hoven? And I'll say, Your Honor, I found this fossil in the ground, buried in the dirt. And it has characteristics that are some human and some ape. The judge would say, or the opposing attorney would say, uh, Mr. Hoven, if you find a fossil in the ground, all you know is it died. You don't even know where it died. You know where it ended up getting buried, and that's all you know. You sure don't know that it had any kids. If you went to the cemetery and dug up a, uh, bones of a person, you would not be able to prove it had any children that lived. And you sure couldn't prove it had any different children. Darwin said, though, in his book, <clears throat> if my theory be true, that's an awfully big if, okay? He said numberless intermediate varieties must have existed. Well, you're right. If you're going to change from a rock to a human, how many steps in between would you have to have? Each of them has to be able to live and move around and grow and reproduce and you know, survive in its environment. So if it can already live and survive in its environment, why is it going to change? They'll say, well, the environment changes, so it has to change. Okay, so you not only have to change the organism billions of times, you have to change the environment billions of times to make the organism want to change for some reason or be able to survive, okay? David Ropp, who teaches uh, uh, or works at the museum, American Museum of Natural History in New York City, he's one of the guys at the museum, and he's a strong believer in evolution. He said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates, the people that promote him, hoped to find predictable progressions by that, you know, sequencing from apes to humans. You know, slightly bigger, slightly bigger, slightly bigger, slightly bigger. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, you're kidding. Fantasy in our textbooks? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, there's fantasy in the textbooks. 
they dig up these fossils. Look, you don't know that it had any kids. And you sure don't know that it had different kids. Dogs today only produce dogs. If you observed dogs for, spent a lifetime, let's see, I think my daughter Marlissa, she's not here tonight, but she was with me in Ireland. We went to eat at a family's house. The guy raises some kind of, you know, prize dog. And he's real proud of these little dogs that he raises, you know. And he was all excited because his, one of his dogs was going to have puppies that day. And he's out driving me around to speak at, you know, some radio station. He said, oh, i got to get home. My wife called. She's having puppies. Oh, no, your wife's not having puppies. Your dog is having puppies. He was all flustered about this. He said, Brother Holman, you don't understand. These puppies are worth $1,000 a piece. I said, you're right. I don't understand. <laughs> Who would pay $1,000 for, you know, that's only going to get this big when you're all done. You know, what's it going to do? Protect the house uh, from the burglars. Now, Jan, your dog is a little more protection, right? Yeah. What's that dog weigh now? 80 pounds. German Shepherd. Yeah, now that, I can see a use for that. But a Chihuahua, I don't see any use for a Chihuahua. You know, somebody goes to break into the house, yip, 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 whap, kick it clear into the next county, you know. <laughs> Your dog, I would not try to kick into the next county. I would turn around and run. Um, but dogs have only produced dogs. People that raise dogs will tell you. I had a lady tell me, uh, oh, a couple months ago, she said, Mr. Oven, my family and my parents and grandparents, we've been involved in raising dogs for, I don't know, 60 years or whatever it was. She said, I sincerely believe that we could start with 50 generic mutts from the dog pound. You supply me 50 mutts. Go pick out the mongrel, any mongrel you want. We, with selective breeding, we will redevelop every breed of dog in the world today in less than 100 years. We could get a Great Dane and a Chihuahua and a St. Bernard and an Airedale and everything in between from 50 generic mutts in 100 years. Most breeds of dogs, if you stop and think about it, they were done by man for some particular reason. Somebody in Europe or England or something wanted to hunt weasels or groundhogs that go down in the hole in the ground. So they kept taking the puppies out of the litter that had the shortest legs. Pretty soon they developed a dachshund. Half a dog high, dog and a half long. He can run down the hole after, you know, whatever they're after. Um, dogs have different characteristics. Those character traits we're already in the original gene code. You just select which one you want. Steve is, what, 6'2"? Becky, 5'7"? When you guys have kids, they're going to be real tall. Eric, you were with me with the preacher in South Florida who taught us to shoot the rubber band. Yeah. He was 6'8". His wife was 6'3". Remember the two daughters? The 13-year-old was already 6'3", daughter. The 15-year-old was 6'5". Both of them still growing like mad. This is in Orlando, I think, or something like that. Traits are inherited. My wife is 5'0". I'm 6'1". If I had married somebody taller, my kids would probably be taller. Sorry about that, boys. <laughs> She's the one I picked, and you get to pick yours, too. Uh, it was your problem how tall you came out. You can live with that. My brothers are 6'3", and they both married taller women, and their kids are much taller. It's just but they're still human. Dogs produce dogs. That's all you're ever going to get. So why would anybody think that after observing dogs producing dogs for several thousand years of human history, what would make anybody conclude that sometime long ago and far away, dogs came from something that was non-dog? What justification would you have for that conclusion? There's no observable evidence for it. There are genetic barriers to keep it from happening. You know, dogs have 78 chromosomes. Adding or losing chromosomes is normally fatal or certainly harmful, like with humans. So doubling the chromosome number, we'll get into that later, uh, uh, polyploidy, doesn't add any new information. Okay, you get those giant strawberries you buy at the store, you know, that they, it's polyploidy. They've doubled the chromosome number. Now, they taste horrible, generally. They don't taste near as good as the regular little tiny strawberries. But they say, wow, look at this giant strawberry. This is proof for evolution today. No, you've simply doubled the chromosome number. You haven't added any new information at all. Luther Sunderland uh, was studying evolution and wanted to find out where the evidence is. So he visited major museums around the world or wrote to major professors who believe in evolution and asked them, what evidence do you have? They would write back or 
when he talked to them face to face, they would say, well, we don't have any evidence, but you know, somebody else has it. They all think somebody else has the evidence. When he contacted Colin Patterson, Colin Patterson is the, uh, one of the curators, the directors of the, Ameri of the British Museum of Natural History. I believe it's in London or near there. They have the largest fossil collection in the world. Nobody has more fossils than the British Museum of Natural History. Display rooms and case after case after case of fossils on display that they've mounted and you know, put up for display. Colin Patterson, the director of this museum, wrote a book about evolution. Wrote how he believes in evolution, how this animal changed to this animal. Well, Luther Sunderland read the book and noticed he told us about evolution, but he never showed us any examples. He never showed us the fossil of the missing link. And there'd have to be zillions of these. He said, Mr. Patterson, where are the missing links? I read your book. Why didn't you show us a picture of one? Colin Patterson wrote back a very interesting confession, and he has since been uh, uh, chided for it many times, I'm sure. Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, you got the biggest fossil collection in the world and you don't know of any missing links? He said, if I knew of any, fossil or living, well, that's an interesting confession. If it's living, how can it be a missing link? Even if it's alive, I would have put it in my book. That's deceitful, okay? He said, if I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. And he goes on to say, for which one can make an airtight or watertight case. If evolution had to be proven in a court of law, it would fail in the first round. Wouldn't make it to the appellate court or the circuit court or Supreme Court. It would fail in the local court. A freshman law student out of Podunk College could say, Your Honor, <laughs> he doesn't have any evidence for evolution. It would be so easy to defeat this if evolution had to be proven in a court of law. But it doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. Evolution has to only sound convincing to the students going through high school. And that's where the problem comes in, my opinion. Folks, there aren't any missing links. No chain is missing. Guys like Stephen Gould, the communist professor at Harvard University, says the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. I sent a set of my videotapes to Stephen Gould. When I went to Harvard, uh, ten year, eight, eight years ago, I guess, I went up there to preach in the area, six, seven, eight years ago. I went to visit Harvard. I went to go see Stephen Gould. He wasn't there that day. But I went and met his secretary, a very nice lady. My tapes were sitting on his shelf in his office. I was so proud of myself. Wow, I hope he's watched them. Okay, Steve, watch them, okay? I want to get you converted. You make a great Christian when we get you saved. All right, let's give an analogy to understand, uh, and all analogies break down at some point, okay, but to help people understand a little bit. Let's make an English sentence here. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Do you use that sentence in your English class, Jan? Not yet. Not yet. You teach English as a second language. This sentence contains every letter of the alphabet. All 26 letters are found in that one sentence. And now you're going to not listen to a thing I say, you're going to sit there and study the sentence. So <laughs> uh, it does, trust me, okay? The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. I could analyze these. Suppose this was Chinese or, you know, Arabic. And I didn't understand anything. This just, to me, it's just a bunch of chalk on a, on a chalkboard, okay? Which is what Arabic looks like to me, a bunch of circles, you know? I don't understand. But they read it. Oh, yeah, it says right here. You know? <laughs> or Hebrew, you know? How confusing can you get? Or oh, Russian. But uh, suppose I was going to analyze this. Just as an outsider who knows nothing about English, I would say, you know, some of these letters are rounded. They have kind of round shapes to them. So we're going to classify them as rounded or squared. Could I classify letters of the English alphabet as rounded or squared and group them? The Q is, would be a rounded one. The O is rounded. The U is rounded. Then I could, now the U actually is more complex. It has part rounded, part squared. So then we're going to have combination. Now the combination letters, the U is a confusing one because the squared part is at the top. The rounded part is at the bottom. 
Others have the rounded part at the bottom and the squared part or the, at the top, like the P. This has the, the round part at the top and the square part at the bottom. So we'll have combination one and combination two. I have basically four different types of letters in the English alphabet. That's kind of what they've done with the DNA sequencing. I could say, well, look at this sequence. We have, for this sentence, the quick brown fox. We have square, 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 round, combination one, square, round. So I can go through and give these a code. S, 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 R, C1, S, R, C2. Does that mean anything? Who cares, okay? That's what they've done with the protein. The DNA sequence, they have said, oh, this is an A, B, C, D. I should look, should look up this, the four letters, uh, the different uh, components of the DNA. I'll get, somebody will blast me for this, I'm sure. But I taught this years ago, and I just forgot at the moment. Um, this would, who cares? Okay? And I could compare this sentence to another sentence and probably find another sentence with a very similar sequence of letters. So, doesn't mean a thing. And the fact that there are some similarities of the proteins and similarities of sequences, it doesn't mean a thing. It has nothing to do with evolution. I've done 55 debates at this time against evolutionists, okay? I'm willing to do any more, any time. I did one uh, in Ohio University, Athens, Ohio, oh, four months ago, I guess. There was two professors against me, two on one. Uh, I just read on the internet last week, one of the professors wrote about his experience debating a creationist, you know. What was it like? Did you read that, Eric? About yeah, we watched the, the videotape didn't turn out very well. The audio was lousy. I wish we could use that because it was, it was really a good debate. But he was uh, whining on the uh, uh, internet on his website about how that, you know, it's unfair to debate creationists because, you know, they're professional debaters. I've never had a debate class in my life, okay? All I know is I'm right, he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy to win a debate when you're confident like that. So I, I emailed him back uh, three days ago. I haven't checked my email uh, yet today yet to find out if I got an answer. I said, because he said in, in, his, in his long diatribe about why you shouldn't debate creationists, he says, you can't be, you, nobody can possibly be trained in all of the different areas they will bring up. You know, you'd have to be a geologist and a biologist and a, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, I hereby challenge your entire science department. I will debate all the teachers in your entire university at the same time. On the condition, it's equal time for each position, not each person. If there's 20 of you and one of me, I want half of the time. That's fair. That way, if I ask, if we get into a topic that deals with biology, have your biology teacher answer it. When I debated uh, Pigliucci at uh, University Knoxville, University of Tennessee in Knoxville, he is a botany Prof assistant professor, associate professor. His PhD is in botany, the study of plants. I said, Mr. Pigliucci, what is your best evidence for evolution? What's the best evidence you know of? He said, the fossil record. Now hold it. You're teaching botany. Why do you think the best evidence is over in some other department? Paleontology. I said, the fossil record of what? He said, the fossil record for the evolution of whales is the best evidence we have. Now think about it. Here's a PhD in botany thinking the evidence for evolution is over in anthropology department. But if you go to the anthropologists and say, where's the evidence for evolution? They'll say, oh, they've got it in the biology department. Ask the biologist, where's the evidence? Oh, the anthropologists have it. Or the geologists have it. Everybody thinks somebody else has the evidence. It's a shell game. You ever see those things at the carnival where they get three shells and they tell you to put a P under there, you know, and the guy tries to get you confused, you know, switching them around? Evolution is a shell game. Each person thinks the P is under a different one. There is no P under any of them. Nobody has the evidence. Nobody has ever found any evidence for evolution. That's why about 10 years ago, in our ministry, we said, look, started off, I guess, 12 years ago, I wrote, wrote a letter to the editor in the local paper here, and I said, I will pay $1,000 for any evidence for evolution. A lawyer friend of mine, a couple of months later, said, hey, Mr. Oven, let's make it $10,000. I'll back you up. 
I said, 10,000? He said, yeah, it's nothing for me. I got plenty. I said, okay. <laughs> we made the offer 10,000. Then a friend of mine from uh, uh, Oregon called me and said, hey, Bill Hovind, let's make it a quarter million. I'll back you up. I'll keep the money in a special account. One quarter million dollars. I can't imagine having a quarter million just to sit around in, a, <laughs> in an account someplace. <laughs> he said, I'll back you up. So we put all kinds of publishing out there. We'll put a quarter million dollars for Evidence Revolution. He called me uh, about a year later and said, hey, let's make it a million. I said, let's keep it at a quarter million. Okay, I've got so much stuff printed that says a quarter million. I don't want to go back and reprint everything. You could offer any amount of evidence, any amount of money. for the. There is no evidence. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog, let, let alone a dog come from a banana. But if you can ever get the evolutionists to see clearly what it is they believe, and I've never had one admit this, but they do believe dogs and bananas have a common ancestor, and the ancestor was a rock. If you boil it down, that's what you get to. They don't see it. I think what's happened here, we have a Romans chapter 1 situation. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them up to vain imaginations. The Bible says God will send them strong delusion. You have to be deluded to think we came from a rock. Now, if you want to believe that, that's fine. But that's not logical. It's not scientific. And that's certainly not going to help you when you stand before God one day. Some people are going to get before God and say, well, I studied the evidence and I believed in evolution. You had to want to believe that. A logical thinking person won't come to that conclusion from studying the evidence. When you look at a complex thing like a watch, I would come to the conclusion, somebody made this. I don't know who he is. Doesn't matter. I don't know where he lives. I'll probably never meet him. I don't have to meet him. I believe he exists. Or at least did exist. I've seen what he did. The painting is proof of the painter. <clears throat> the object is proof of the designer. That's all you need. I could probably learn, I could probably analyze a few things about, I could tell you a few things about the guy that made this watch. Even though I don't know, have a, never met him, probably never will. Probably speaks Japanese, lives in Japan apparently. I would say he's a logical thinker. He's got the numbers in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. He must think logically. I could probably deduce a few character traits. He must be patient. Be able to put them little bitty things on there. Must be uh, precise. Must be very smart. He must have a good knowledge of electronics. He must have a good knowledge of different materials. He knows certain plastics can be used certain places, but they couldn't be used other places. You wouldn't want to use plastic in the watch band. How long would that last? You can use it for the buttons. He has a knowledge of quite a few things. A knowledge of materials. Never met the guy, but I can already tell you a few things about him. I've never met God, but I can tell you a few things about him. He's real smart. He's patient. He's loving. Just by seeing the creation, I can determine some things about the Creator. And that's the way it ought to be. All right, next week we will continue with more on... Uh, we're going to try to finish up what's on my videotape number four of my series and then get into what's on videotape number five, which is the New World Order. We'll cover that. Hopefully by week three or four we'll get that far. Thank you so much. See you next week.